History Museum, and uh, although his PhD is in education from Harvard, education history, education ah. history, <laughs> his dissertation was on the history of financial aid in the United States. Yeah. So he's no stranger to the kind of uh, archival research that you've all been doing. I understand that he spent many hours in uh, special collections and in uh, university collections around the country for the research for his dissertation. So please join me in welcoming President Holtzschneider. Well, good afternoon. So, well, that was almost as good as church. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful to be with you, and I have a lot of respect when people come out at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. That, uh, that says that they, uh, you really believe you have something to listen to today, and so do I. Um, I, I, I want to start, though, um, with my congratulations and my respect for our students, for the work that you've done um, that brought you to today. Um, this is an extraordinary amount of work. Um, and it's, it's no small gift to the world to help a world understand itself. And that's indeed what your discipline does. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a key and important ma matter for the social community um, as we try to move forward together in ways that actually serve us as a world community. And to the degree that you can get things right and get things told well, you give the world back to herself. And I really respect the work that you've undertaken and that you brought to, um, out into the open today. Um, that requires a bit of courage, um, a bit of walking through your fears, um, and a bit of handing it over to others um, who will then critique and make it better. It is the way of the intellectual community and you've entered into the intellectual project today. And I have lots of respect for you for doing that. And I have lots of gratitude to your faculty um, for making that possible today, the staff of your department that worked so hard to make this possible, uh, some of your fellow students who volunteered. But to a great deal, I have, great, I have gratitude for your faculty who have brought you all the way to this moment and welcomed you into um, the discipline itself, and welcomed you into the life, um, that, and taught you and shared with you and, and, and helped you succeed in the ways you have. Um, their work, um, your success is their success. And I really thank all of you today and, and stand in respect of that. Um, I also have the great honor of recognizing this moment in its naming. And that is as the, uh, the Daniel Goffman keynote lecture. Um, as you know, um, Dr. Goffman um, is an extraordinary um, scholar of history himself, having worked in the Ottoman world um, two very important books um, along the way, um, most recently, 2007, I think the most recent one came out. Um, it is a, but when his colleagues talk about him, they talk not just about their fellow scholar, um, they talk about their former chair and colleague, who they talk about the difference he made for the department over time. There, there are various ways to coexist as a department, and we see them all in academia. Um, and there's, there is something to be said about helping a group of people cohere and love to be together and to work together and to, to truly create colleagues. And it's, a, it's not automatic and it's never to be taken for granted. And it was a great gift among all the other work that a chair does. Um, this one has lingered and is still spoken of very respectfully. Um, it is for not only his scholarship, but his gift to the intellectual community here that I'm honored and DePaul is honored that his name can go forward on this lecture for many, many years to come. And so I want to thank him um, for all that he's done. And 
if you will indulge me, I'd like to introduce our speaker and her important work through a side door, if I can. Um, and that's uh, through the side door of, of a news story that at least many of us have been following in the past week. Um, you may know, because it's somewhat clear, that the largest provider of private education in the United States is the Catholic Church. And you may or may not know that the largest provider of health care, the private provider of health care in the United States is the Catholic Church. One out of six Americans gets their health care through the church. And the largest pr private provider of social services in the nation, the Catholic Church. The largest provider of refugee resettlement, bar none, even the federal government, larger than them, the Catholic Church. Um, what's been hard this week is, is to remember that all of this was pretty much created by women, and especially women religious nuns. Um, so much shamefully this past week, um, the Vatican office accused American nuns of being disloyal. Um, and in the meantime, of having, having that put on them in an accusatory kind of a way, all of the storytelling of the, of the church and what it had become because of their work was left out of the story. Um, truly, without their work, um, this church and the work it continues to do in the U.S. would be a shell of itself. Um, and that story um, should not be left aside. But in truth, it is. And lest we think this is just because of um, white-haired men in an office somewhere in Rome, um, it is women that leave this story out at times, too. Someday, feminist history is due to be rewritten and to put women religious and nuns back in it, because there is no way to talk about the education of women in the United States without talking about nuns. You can at the kind of the wealthy Protestant women's education level, but otherwise, if you want to talk about the great waves of immigration, if you want to talk the resettlement from east to west, this is women religious that, brought, that educated women in the United States and helped them take their place and literally change the nation. And someday, um, women's history will include them but it does not largely at the moment. Um, it is the truth in all the telling of history that there are times when the key players of our own stories are left out of our stories. And that's the great, uh, that's the great contribution that you are about to hear. You are about to hear about the key role of women um, in the civil rights movement and, all that it, in, and in its prehistory. Um, this is no gift to women's history. This is a gift to our story. This is a gift to all of us to know our story and then to be moved by it and changed by it and defined by it in both its aspirations, its inspirations, and the way that it sobers us and helps us see the truth. And so this is no small gift that's been given us in this latest book and this project. And so I'm thrilled to welcome to DePaul and introduce to you, Dr. Daniel McGuire. That's an incredible introduction. <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting me here and for joining me this afternoon. It's an honor to be here at DePaul and a wonderful opportunity to see some incredible student work I was able to sit in on two panels um, this afternoon, and it was really enlightening and exciting to see the students engage in primary research and in the way we tell history and teach history, discuss it. So thank you so much. I thought I'd start with a story. In 1944, in Abbeville, Alabama, an African-American woman named Recy Taylor walked home from a church revival. A carload of white men kidnapped her off the street, drove her to the woods, and they gang raped her at gunpoint. Then they dropped her off in the middle of town and they told her if she told anybody what happened, it would kill her. It's a pretty credible threat in 1944 in Alabama. Somehow she found the courage to tell her husband, her father, and the local sheriff the details of the assault. A few days later, she received a phone call from the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. And they called to tell her 
that they would send their very best investigator. It was Rosa Parks. It was 11 years before the bus boycott. Rosa Parks had family in Abbeville. Her father's kin was from there. And so she went to Abbeville and she met with Taylor on Taylor's front porch with her notebook and pen and she took Taylor's testimony. And then she carried her story back to Montgomery where she and the city's most militant activists organized the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor. The Chicago Defender, one of the nation's largest black newspapers, called this campaign the largest movement for equal justice to be seen in a decade. They compared it really only in scope to the Scottsboro movement of the 1930s. I found this uh, note card, postcard, in the Montgomery, uh, Alabama archives in uh, 2004, I believe, and I was shocked when I started to see the names of the Montgomery activists, the bus boycott activists, on a postcard from 1944. And what's interesting is that 11 years later, this group of homegrown activists that had created this national and even international movement would become better known as the Montgomery Improvement Association, the organization that brought us the 1955 bus boycott, and the organization that vaunted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to international prominence and started a movement that would become known all around the world. But when the organization first took root in 1944, Dr. King was just in high school. So the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott is often heralded as the opening scene in the civil rights drama. But I think, in many ways, it's really one of the last acts in a decades-long struggle to protect black women like Reese Taylor from sexualized violence and rape. In fact, the kidnapping and rape of Reese Taylor was hardly unusual in the segregated South. From slavery through the better part of the 20th century, white men abducted and assaulted black women with alarming regularity, with stunning uniformity, and all too often with impunity. They lured black women and girls away from home with promises of work or better wages. They attacked them on the job. They kidnapped them at gunpoint when they were walking home from work or church or school. And they sexually harassed and assaulted them in public places like buses and park benches and taxi cabs and on street corners. And this was the pattern throughout the 1940s and the 1950s. And it really underscored the limits of Southern justice. This is the thing. Black women didn't always keep their stories secret. In fact, they often testified about their assaults. And we can see a history of this from the slave narratives of Harry Jacobs to Ida B. Wells to Fannie Lou Hamer's stark testimony about a forced hysterectomy that she received and a sexualized beating that she received in 1963 in Winona, Mississippi. Black women publicly told their stories. And they reclaimed their humanity by using these testimonies to organize protest campaigns, to organize committees that would fight to bring their assailants to justice. And their testimonies often led to larger campaigns for civil rights and human dignity all around the South. In fact, I think even the most oft-told and illustrious civil rights struggles, like the Montgomery bus boycott, like the Selma struggle in 1965, the 1964 Freedom Summer in Mississippi. They almost all have an unexamined history of gendered political appeals for the protection of black women from sexual violence. And yet, I think, we don't hear much about these stories. And so what I try to do in the book is I argue that rape and resistance to rape actually sits at the center of the modern day civil rights movement. And you know something about the civil rights movement, I assume, being young historians and practiced historians. Um, so what does popular history tell us about the bus boycott? Who is the most important person in the Montgomery bus boycott, according to popular history? Rosa Parks. That's right, Rosa Parks. And what was it about Ms. Parks that 
uh, made her not want to get out of her seat that day, again, according to popular history. She was tired. She, was tired. she had tired feet, right? Rosa Parks had tired feet. It's a great story, except it's pretty useless, right? I mean, are we really expected to believe that Montgomery, the cradle of the Confederacy, fell because of a black woman's foot fatigue? Really? This is the story that's repeated endlessly. When asked the same question, Joe Asbell, who was the Montgomery Advertiser City Editor, the white newspaper in Montgomery, he talked about somebody else. He talked about a woman named Gertrude Perkins. And this is what he had to say. How do I turn it up? How do I turn it up? Ian here? We didn't turn it up. Okay. I'm going to start the slide again. Aha. The area marked volume. <laughs> okay. So this is what he had to say. Gertrude Perkins is not even mentioned in the history but she had as much to do with the bus boycott and its creation as anyone on earth. Now, I heard this in 1998. I was listening to NPR, and there was a story about veterans of the Montgomery bus boycott. And if you're wondering or thinking what I was thinking in 1998, you're thinking, well, OK, well, who the heck is Gertrude Perkins? And how come I haven't heard anything about her? Because this is what I thought. I thought I knew something about the civil rights movement as a master's student. The University of Wisconsin, and, and I had never heard this before. So I did some research and I found out that Gertrude Perkins was an African American woman who was walking home from a party in 1949, and two white Montgomery police officers uh, picked her up, told her that they were arresting her, drove her outside of and assaulted her. This is what Reverend Solomon Say Sr., one of the more outspoken ministers in Montgomery, had to say about it at the time. Two policemen had picked her up and taken her down on the railroad and had all types of sex relations with her at that particular time. And when they, when they put her out, she came to my door and she told me what had happened to her. I sat down and wrote what she said had happened to her, word by word. And when she had finished, I had it notarized and sent it to Drew Pearson in Washington. And Drew Pearson went to, to the air with him. And when the power truck you knew uh, anything here in Montgomery, what Gertrude Perkins said happened to her was all over the nation. And this was a brilliant strategy, right? He took it to a syndicated columnist. He knew there was no reason to go to the police in many ways, although they did that too. Um, but he hit them with that first. And so when they went to the police station, it was already on the radio. The story was already there. And so they had to react, he thought anyway, with some kind of compassion that they would at least have to go through the motions. But they didn't. In fact, the police refused to hold a lineup or issue any warrants. The mayor said her claim was completely false and then said, my policeman would not do a thing like that. But African Americans in Montgomery knew better. They knew the police there had a reputation not just for racist brutality, but also for sexual violence. And so they organized. They organized a committee. Because they knew that the police had this history. In 1946, for example, police officers abducted and raped the 16-year-old daughter of a black woman who refused a bus driver's orders. And you see the committee forming in 1946 to defend this young woman. People like Edie Nixon and Reverend Say and others. And you see an attempt by the black community to keep the story, or at least the, the news of what had happened to this young girl, in uh, the city's collective mind. So Vernon Johns, for example, who was the minister at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church before Dr. King got there, he wrote, when the rapist is white on the church marquee. This is a pretty bold statement. So in 1949, when Gertrude Perkins was attacked, the same leaders came together to form a committee on her behalf. 
NAACP members, labor leaders, members of the Women's Political Council, they created an umbrella organization called the Citizens Committee for Gertrude Perkins, and they demanded an investigation, and they demanded a trial. Their public pressure kept the story of what the police did to Gertrude Perkins in the city's papers for nearly two months, including on the front pages of the city's white newspaper. They forced a grand jury hearing, and I think importantly for the creation of an infrastructure for the civil rights movement, they brought the city's disparate ministers together. They had been in the habit of going their separate ways and fighting amongst themselves, and this case brought the city's disparate ministers together for the first time. Two years later, activists in Montgomery would rally to defend another victim of white sexual violence. In 1951, a grocery store owner named Sam Green raped a black teenager named Flossie Hardman. Now Flossie Hardman was Sam Green's babysitter. And she often worked for his family. And at the end of her shift, she would drive him home. He would drive her home and uh, call it a night. Except one night, he decided instead to pull to the side of a quiet road and he attacked her. Well, she told her parents. Her parents filed uh, a lawsuit. And when an all-white jury refused to issue an indictment or um, bring back a guilty verdict, the city agreed to mobilize. The black citizens in the city agreed to mobilize. And the same people came together. The same people who helped Lucy Taylor and who helped Gertrude Perkins and who rallied to defend Viola White, they came together to form the committee for Flossie Hardman. And instead of trying to create public pressure, what they did was boycott Sam Green's grocery store because his store was in the black community. And they figured if he was going to make their, his living off of African Americans, then they could boycott it and potentially shut it down. And after only two weeks, they delivered their own guilty verdict by driving Sam Green into the red. Not only was this important because it was a kind of um, pure victory, but it established the boycott as a really effective tool for justice. In fact, just a couple years later, Joanne Robinson, who was the leader of the Militant Women's Political Council, would threaten a boycott on the city's buses after scores of black women complained about mistreatment and humiliation on the city's buses. And the truth is that besides police officers, few were as guilty of these crimes as were the city's bus operators who bullied and brutalized black passengers daily. Worse, I think police uh, bus drivers acted like police. They carried blackjacks and guns. And they were empowered to use them to enforce Jim Crow. In 1953 alone, African Americans filed over 30 complaints of abuse and mistreatment on the city's buses, most of which came from working class black women who were mainly domestics. You know, they had no choice but to ride the buses. They had to take them from the black side of town where they lived to the white side of town where they worked mainly in white women's kitchens. And it turns out they made up about 70, 80% of the city line's ridership. And they complained about all kinds of things. They argued that drivers hurled nasty sexualized insults, that they touched them inappropriately, and that they physically abused them. One woman remembered bus drivers sexually harassing her as she waited on the corner. The bus was up high, she said, and the street was down low. They drive up and expose themselves while I was just standing there, she said. It scared me to death. Another woman said, bus drivers treat black women just as rough as can be, she said, as if we're an animal. Another woman said that bus drivers like to talk under folks' clothes. Rosa Parks argued in 1956 that women walk not in support of her, but because she said, I was not the only person who had been mistreated and humiliated. Other women, she said, had gone through similarly shameful experiences, most worse than mine. It was these experiences that propelled African American women into every conceivable aspect of the bus boycott. 
So although the story is told from a primarily male perspective, it was women who were the chief negotiators and strategists of the bus boycott. It was women who ran the day-to-day -day operation. Black women helped staff the elaborate carpool system that kept the boycott working. They helped raise most of the local money for the movement, mostly by making delicious uh, chicken dinners while they were working for white women, and then taking those dinners downtown to sell them and bringing the money back to mass meetings for the movement. That's brilliant. And if you look at any history book, any picture version of the Civil Rights Movement, what you'll see is black women filling the pews at all of those mass meetings. They use those meetings to testify publicly about the shame and humiliation that Jim Crow inflicted on them. And then they transform that humiliation into a kind of uh, collective burden that they could transcend together. And of course, because they made up nearly 80% of the city line's ridership, they were the majority of the walkers. By walking hundreds of miles to protest humiliation, African American women reclaimed their bodies and demanded the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And so while the bus boycott is so often portrayed as a kind of spontaneous or male-led movement, the truth is that it had a past that it's rooted in this decades-long struggle to protect and defend black womanhood from racial and sexual violence. And I think unless we understand that, it's impossible to situate the boycott in its proper historical context. In fact, it's impossible to understand the boycott unless we know the stories of Greasy Taylor and Gertrude Perkins and Flossie Hardman and all of the women who helped make the boycott possible. And I think without their stories, it's impossible for us to understand why. Why so many women were willing to walk in defense of their personhood and to protest segregation on the buses? Now, lest we think this is an aberration, Montgomery isn't the only place where protests against black women um, being assaulted fueled struggles against white supremacy. You see little uh, civil rights campaigns in places like Little Rock, Arkansas, where Daisy Bates, who was the heroine of the Little Rock school desegregation movement, she argued that the rape and murder of her mother actually fueled her interest in justice. Throughout the 1940s and the 1950s, for example, Daisy Bates used her newspaper, the Arkansas State Press, as a kind of megaphone to publicly shame white men who assaulted black women and then used those stories as kind of catalysts or prods to get the black community to organize to try to bring these assailants to justice. Or Albany, Georgia in 1962, which became known as the singing movement. You see local people organizing to defend black women at Albany State College from sort of gangs of white men who prowled around campus at night looking for black women to assault. Like the Albany State uh, football team was often brought in at night to protect black girls in the dorms. Or Mississippi in the 1964 Freedom Summer. We often think that because black women weren't targets for lynching, they were less vulnerable to racial violence. And so it was easier for them to do voter registration work. But when they got arrested for doing that work and went to jail, that's when they were sexually assaulted, humiliated, and attacked. It was behind closed doors. All of these major campaigns have roots in the organized resistance to sexualized violence and demands for the protection of black womanhood. And yet, analyses of rape play little or no role in most histories of the civil rights movement, even as stories of violence against black and white men, like Goodman and Schwerner and Cheney or Emmett Till, provide really gripping analyses of racist brutality. And so I think if we're going to really understand the modern civil rights movement, then we need to understand this history. And the truth is that this history goes all the way back to slavery. Right? Because the sexual exploitation of black women's uh, bodies had its roots <coughs> in slavery. Slave owners stolen access to black women's bodies strengthened their political, their social, and their economic power for, I think, very simply two reasons. One is that colonial laws made the children of slave women the property of their masters, giving slave owners a financial incentive to sexually exploit their slaves. They could just make more slaves and increase their wealth and their power. 
And two, colonial laws banned interracial marriage, but not fornication or childbirth out of wedlock, which gave white men exclusive sexual access to white women while denying black women the respectability and rights garnered by illegal relationship, especially inheritance rights. These laws created a system that allowed black, uh, white men to police white women's sexual and marital choices and sexually abuse black women with impunity, both of which maintained their position atop a racial and economic hierarchy. And after slavery fell, the practices that went with these laws, and in some cases the laws, particularly the law banning interracial marriage, they remained. For example, during Reconstruction, Former slaveholders and their sympathizers used violence to reassert power and control over free people, and rape became a kind of weapon of terror. And interracial rape became a battleground upon which black men and women fought for ownership and control of their own bodies. So while black women were the primary victims of interracial rape during Reconstruction, that's not the story that white people told. They argued that it was black men who were the rapists, and it was white women who were the main victims of interracial rape. In fact, whites used interracial rape as a justification to lynch black men in order to maintain their own power. And to keep their positions on top, they created the myth of the black beast rapist, right? this mythological incubus who would swoop down on women when they're sleeping, when they're most vulnerable, and attack them. And this myth became a very popular political tool to be deployed whenever whites feared losing political power. For example, white Democrats in North Carolina played on uh, white people's fear of the incubus in 1900 to regain political control after a biracial fusion party. Black Republicans and white populists took every single statewide seat in 1896. And this political tactic continued throughout the 20th century. Black men used to joke, for example, in the 1940s that the closer they got to the ballot box, the more they looked like a rapist. And we see this especially uh, after the Supreme Court issued the 1954 decision outlawing segregation in public schools. Because the truth is that for most segregationists, integration only meant miscegenation. Or, as Mississippi judge and founder of the White Citizens Council put it, amalgamation. America has its choice. And you can see headlines in the Citizens Council's newspapers. And you know what the Citizens Council is probably, right? It's kind of an uptown Ku Klux Klan, sort of the Chamber of Commerce version of the Klan. And these were businessmen and bankers and doctors and lawyers. They didn't necessarily uh, commit acts of racist brutality, but they fomented the energy that enabled these crimes to come to fruition. But they had newspapers, and if you read their newspapers, you'll find these headlines. And so there were headlines that said, you know, the incubus was coming, mixed marriage, sex orgies, and accounts of black men raping white girls were, according to the Citizens Council newspapers, typical of stories filtering back from areas where racial integration is proceeding with all deliberate speed. So they even appropriate the language of the Supreme Court decision. Here's a Citizens Council leader actually espousing these theories in a speech. Don't you ever give up that gun. That's all you've got left to protect that little baby in that crib. Because these dirty devils will be in your home. That's what they want. They do not want equality. You know they don't want equality. They don't want something like you got. They want what you got, your women. Because segregationists employed these kinds of sexual scare tactics to oppose brown and cultivate white fear and resentment towards integration, any kind of racial or gender impropriety on the part of African Americans could be deemed as threatening the social order. And I think that's why African Americans in Montgomery chose the more respectable Rosa Parks, as opposed to any of the other black women who had been arrested on the buses, uh, you know, to serve as the city's symbol of segregation. 
like Claudette Colvin or Mary Louise Smith. And I think it's also why African Americans at the time downplayed Rosa Parks' militancy, especially her history as an anti-rape activist. But I also think it's historians' fault that we don't know this stuff, that our own reliance on theories of dissemblance or on our focus on respectability has actually ignored what black women had been testifying about for so long. And as a result, I think we've missed really important milestones in the history of the civil rights movement. One of those, of course, is the Tallahassee case of 1959. The arrest, trial, and conviction of four white men for raping Betty Jean Owens, a black college student at Florida A&M in the spring of 1959 was really a watershed event. Owens' testimony in a segregated courtroom focused national attention on this issue of white-on-black sexual violence. And when an all-white jury handed down a life sentence, the first of its kind in the South, it not only broke with Southern tradition, but it fractured the philosophical and political foundations of white supremacy by challenging the legal relationship between sexual domination and racial inequality. For perhaps the first time since Reconstruction, African Americans could imagine state power or the courts actually intervening to protect their manhood and womanhood. Betty Jean Owens' grandmother, who was born in the shadow of slavery, she recognized the importance of this verdict. She said, I've lived to see the day where white men could really be brought to trial for what they've done. This case led to convictions elsewhere that summer, in Montgomery, Alabama, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in Burton, South Carolina, where a white Marine actually received the death penalty for raping a black woman, the first of its kind. I have to say in a footnote, of course, that it was overturned on appeal. And never, not once, in the 12 years that I spent researching this topic, did I ever find a white man sentenced to death for raping a black woman, even though it was a capital crime in every single southern state, and even though black men were waiting on death row for lesser crimes, or for looking at a white woman the wrong way, or had been put to death for that reason. But all of these convictions came about because of the courage and strength of black women who testified on their own behalf and white supremacy faltered in the face of these courageous women's testimonies. John McCrae, who was the editor of the South Carolina Lighthouse and Informer, a black newspaper in South Carolina, he wondered if these convictions pointed to a new day. I've lived to see the day, he said, where this forced intimacy that goes back to the days of slavery, when our women were the chattel property of white men, I've lived to see the day, he said, when our women are finally gaining the emancipation they've so deserved. McCrae's connection between black women's emancipation and white men's conviction, I think, is really profound. He recognized that freedom was meaningless without ownership and control of your own body. What did it mean if you could vote? or if you could sit at a lunch counter, if you could not walk down the street unmolested. Ella Baker said as much in 1960 after the sit-ins when she said that the freedom struggle was about more than public accommodations. It was about more than access, she said. It was bigger than a hamburger. A 1965 case in Hattiesburg, Mississippi was another important milestone that I think historians have missed. A little background. In the months before SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee sent uh, black and white students into Mississippi to try to open up that state and draw national attention to the crimes committed there. Segregationists there prepared for what they saw as a sexual invasion. I mean, these are their words. In fact, the mayor of Jackson got a tank for his police force and encouraged them to be armed for the coming army of amalgamation. But if they were really worried about illicit integration, if 
they were really worried about this, I think they should have focused their wrath on the white men who had a history of integrating with black women. Black people call it nighttime integration, something that they had been doing for a long, long time. Here's a clip of Indisha Ida Mae Holland who testifies about black women and girls' special vulnerability in the Magnolia State. I went to a babysit for this white family and uh, the white woman called me upstairs. I went on upstairs in a hurry so as not to keep the white woman waiting. She said, Mr. Laws wants to see you. And I looked in the bed, Mr. Laws was laying there among the bed clothes. They were so silky. And uh, I said, uh, yes sir, Mr. Laws, what you want with me? And he immediately pulled me down into the bed and had intercourse with me. It was on, I was 11 years old that day, it was my birthday. It was no reason for us to run tell our mother or our father because they couldn't do anything about it. But get killed as they said something about it so many times. Girls, we girls would talk in the bathroom about it. You know, never telling our parents, but it, it happened very, very frequently. of black life in Mississippi uh, left more than physical scars. It left deep psychological wounds, and not just in the victims. I hated it. I, I had all kind of fantasies about it. I was fascinated by people like David and Goliath stories. When I, these are my favorite biblical characters, the cats who kick folks' butt. You know, I like Moses drowning everybody in the Red Sea. I used to go in the woods. I used to go in the backwoods and preach and scream, bite them, run into bushes, hit trees, pretend they was white folks. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to how to negotiate your life with white folks. And I guess you also learn uh, the fear associated with them of, uh, of how much power they actually held over you, how, how they can determine whether you continue to live uh, or whether you die. I think this is why I found it so inspiring and amazing that women under these circumstances were willing to still testify about these kinds of attacks that the very act of testimony was something that put them at great risk, put their families at great risk, and yet they did it. And after two decades of black women's testimony about sexual violence, an all-white jury finally sentenced Norman Cannon, a 19-year-old white man, to life in prison for raping a black teenager in 1965. Major newspapers like the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune hailed this verdict as unprecedented, and as a sign that even Mississippi was finally making some serious changes. Now, I will say in a footnote that uh, Norman Cannon was the only assailant that I found who actually stayed in prison for his entire sentence. Uh, the men in Tallahassee were almost all released after four or five years, and Norman Cannon appealed in 2000, and his appeal was denied. So as, long, as far as I know, I think he's still uh, in prison in Mississippi. Um, one of the uh, questions that I had while I was doing this research was whether or not black women had the right to defend themselves. Did they have the right to defend themselves with violence, if necessary, in order to protect um, their bodies? And this question was answered with the 1975 trial of Joanne Little. Now, Joanne Little was a petite, 20-year-old, African-American inmate in the Beaufort County Jail in Washington, North Carolina. And one night in August of 1974, Clarence Ollygood, the 65-year-old jailer, came into her cell with an ice pick and allegedly threatened to rape her. Somehow, this very petite woman, she stands about shoulder height next to me, uh, managed to defend herself and got the ice pick away from Ollygood and then stabbed him to death. And then she escaped. North Carolina put her on trial for murder. And while she was preparing for her defense, a broad coalition 
of organizers and supporters rallied to her defense. People from the National Organization of Women all the way to folks in the Black Panther Party. Like the 1944 campaign for equal justice for Recy Taylor, the Free Joanne Little movement was led primarily by African American women, including, as it turned out, Rosa Parks, who headed up the Detroit chapter of the Free Joanne Little campaign. At her trial, prosecutors tried to paint Little as a typical black Jezebel, a stereotype that was rooted in slavery. They suggested that she actually wanted to have sex with the jailer and that she lured him into her cell and asked him to bring an ice pick um, <laughs> in an effort to uh, escape, an elaborate effort to escape. Little's attorney, on the other hand, fit her story into a much longer and more painful history. He read to the jury a long passage from a black woman's 1902 essay decrying their special vulnerability in a system where white men could abuse them with impunity. And so by reading this passage aloud and pointing to the past, Little's attorney bore witness to the decades of abuse that black women had suffered, but he also pointed to their decades of testimony. And so after deliberating for over an hour, the jury, which was half white and half black, half male and half female, a product really of both the civil rights and the women's rights movements, voted unanimously to acquit Joanne Little. As the jury foreman read the verdict, Joanne Little broke into sobs at the defense table and her lawyers clustered around her. And in my imagination, I've always wondered if she was channeling John McRae, the newspaper editor from South Carolina who wondered if black women had finally achieved emancipation when she said, it feels so good to be free. This cartoon in the Baltimore Afro-American hailed the verdict as a major victory. Here, Little's portrayed as a champion boxer, her glove fists uh, pushed up into the air by her attorneys, and she's standing atop a battered and bruised Jim Crow. And here, her attorneys proclaim victory for their champ and a triumph over Dixie racism. I don't know, look closely at old Jim Crow. He's got stars swirling around his head. He looks pretty overweight and pretty tired in those worn out Confederate flag shorts. At least in this case, this one time, old Jim Crow is finally down for the count. Now, it's been nearly seven decades since Rosa Parks rode down to Abbeville, Alabama, to gather the facts in Recy Taylor's case. The national and even international campaign that she started drew attention to the ruthless heart of the racial caste system. I met Recy Taylor in January of 2009, the same day that a million Americans went to Washington, D.C. to witness the inauguration of the nation's first black president. And so we watched the inauguration in her brother's little kitchen in Abbeville. And I asked her if she ever believed that an African-American woman would become the first lady. Not in my lifetime, she said. Growing up in the Jim Crow South, Reese Taylor knew that black women weren't even considered ladies. In fact, from slavery to the bulk of the 20th century, whites denied black women the most basic citizenship and human rights, especially the right to ownership and control of their own bodies. To see Michelle Obama take her place among a pantheon of distinguished American women was to bear witness to black women's centuries-long struggle for dignity and respect. Understanding that struggle, Michelle Obama told the Washington Post, in 2008 was, quote, a process of uncovering the shame, digging out the pride that is part of that story so that other folks, she said, feel comfortable about embracing the beauty and tangled nature of the history of this country. The brutal rape of Recy Taylor in 1944 and the sexual exploitation of thousands of other black women is a central part of our history been unacknowledged for far too long. But black women's testimonies made it impossible for us to ignore it. Recy Taylor never received justice in the nation's courts. 
But last spring, the Alabama State Legislature passed a resolution apologizing for the states, and this is their quote, morally abhorrent and repugnant failure to properly investigate her case in 1944. And I, as far as I know, I think it's the first apology of its kind to be given to a woman who was raped in this way. And so while, you know, apology is not exactly justice, reparations might have been nice, or maybe uh, putting these men in jail, it is still a very important step towards recognizing Taylor's humanity. Even the governor of Alabama had to do that. Until we come to terms with our history, until we provide what historian Nell Painter calls a fully loaded cost accounting of white supremacy, we can neither really understand the past nor appreciate the present. Thank you so much for having me.